right, guys, let's get this uh, uh, presentation underway. Um, 500 Days to Nowhere. My name is David Zarling. I'm the uh, head of investment strategy and research here at Client First Tax and Wealth Advisors. We use the adaptive investment management system to help uh, manage risk in our clients' portfolios. As always, these presentations are for informational and educational purposes. Uh, those of you viewing this, uh, we don't know your personal situation. Uh, we know our client's personal situation, but we may not know yours. And so uh, you shouldn't be using this information as um, something to be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. If you will want a full uh, legal restriction, uh, you can view it on our website here on clientfirsttaxandwealth.com. The uh, address is provided here and also provided in the description. This presentation is part of our Lunch and Learn education series that we do on an ongoing basis. It's typically the third Wednesday of every month. Uh, we've got some really good topics. It could be estate planning. It could be uh, true holistic planning. Um, it could be about your tax situation. Um, it could be about property and casualty insurance. Every quarter, it's uh, my responsibility to give some market insights to those in attendance. And we have a good group. We had 150 uh, people, guests this last time. It was a lot of fun. We eat good food. We learn some new things. We talk markets. Um, it's, it's a great, great avenue uh, to come check us out. If you're ever interested, you can go online and you can see our schedule here. I've listed it. I'll also put it in the video description, but come check us out. It's, uh, it's free. It's something you can come to um, and learn some new things. Uh, but once again, every quarter uh, we go through the market, we identify how the adaptive system works, and then we cover what's going on in markets and what the game plan is going forward. So let's jump into our agenda. What's going to be covered in this video? We're going to talk about how does the adaptive system navigate on certain markets. For some of you, this will be a refresher. Uh, for some of you, this will be new. And so to give you a good idea how we think about things. We're also going to discuss um, what Christmas Eve would have been like without adaptive. Um, that'll be something interesting that you might be able to participate in by just sending us an email. Uh, during our presentation, we did an adaptive quiz, but we're not going to do that during this video just because there's no uh, chance for us to interact. But if you wanted to get the adaptive quiz, you could. Uh, it's a four-question uh, quiz that we could send you if you want to have uh, fun going through that. We're going to talk about the 500 days to nowhere, what's been going on in the past uh, basically 20 to 24 months, depending on what we're looking at. We're going to go through that and then where we are now in the market. We're going to stay disciplined to the adaptive game plan. We're going to discuss what those next steps are. There's a great panel discussion with uh, Ian and myself and Paul. Uh, Paul uh, interviews us. Ian is our new market analyst. Um, he's part of the adaptive team. Um, he's going to be helping uh, our clients, whether it's getting onboarded or helping us diagnose uh, the proper places to be uh, with our investments in, in portfolios. So we're excited to have him, and it'll give you a chance to meet him digitally, if you will, uh, by watching this video. And then we've got some housekeeping and final thoughts. We're going to move pretty quick. All right, so if you need to pause this and get a cup of coffee or whatever you need to do, we're going to fly, so get ready. For us and our clients, we use the Adaptive Investment Management System to manage client portfolios. It's very different than a lot of other places that preach buy and hold investing, which means you hold on no matter what is going on within the market, whether risk is high or not. Uh, we disagree with that methodology the same way we also disagree with massive diversification. We're gonna have some diversification, but we're gonna be focused on the areas of strength. In this next section here, we're gonna specifically talk about how do we identify risk and how do we manage risk once um, it's greater than reward and how do we identify that scenario. So the first thing about adaptive is that it's all based on price. Price is fact, right? We, we can't get past, um, you know, for example, if our neighbor down the street sells their house and you see the purchase price and you're like, I cannot believe they got that price. We can say, oh, we think that price is wrong, but we also know the price is right. Our opinion says maybe the price is wrong, but the price is right because a buyer and seller agreed upon that price. Same thing in markets. You can have whatever opinion you want, okay, regarding the market, but in the end, it's where buyers and sellers agree to make their exchange, and that's price. What I have as an illustration on the screen here is S&P 500. 
Most of you are familiar with the Dow Jones. That's the most talked about one on the TV and uh, radio. Um, that's fine. It represents about 30 U.S. stocks. The S&P 500 represents, like it sounds, about 500 U.S. large cap stocks. It gives us a good idea of what's going on with the U.S. stock market. It's not everything, but it gives us a good idea of what's going on. And we can see price happening, right? Price is the interaction of supply and demand, economic law. More supply than demand, price drops. More demand than supply, price rises. We can see this on this chart here. This goes back to the late 90s. Dot-com bust, we can see more selling than buying, pushing prices down. And more buying than selling, pushing prices up. And this happens over and over and over in markets. And for context, the move from here to here in the S&P 500 in the early 2000s was about more minus 46%. From here to here was about minus 57%. One of the benefits of going through this type of market when you're young is that you get to dollar cost average into these type of markets, meaning if you're making daily deposits every month into a trough like this, that can be a benefit. It is also a majorly double-edged sword when you are nearer in retirement and you start taking distributions out of a market like this it's a huge drawback or detriment to your retirement portfolio. So we have found a way to navigate uncertain markets. And the first thing we need to do is identify the trend of the market. How we do that, this blue line that's running through here now, is a prior 40 weeks of information averaged. Okay, so imagine going shopping, let's, call it, let's say grocery shopping once a week for 40 weeks, you keep track of what you spent each week. After 40 weeks, you, you tallied it up, you added it up, divided by 40, that's your average for the past 40 weeks, and then track that forward in time. You would get a really good idea, is my grocery bill going up in trend or is it in a downtrend? Same thing with markets. This blue line helps us identify, are we in an uptrend or are we in a downtrend? We want to be invested with uptrends and protecting during downtrends. Now, how do we make that actionable? This blue line that's on here now is the prior 10 weeks of information averaged. Blue line, 40 weeks. Orange line, 10 weeks. Okay? And what we know is that when orange is below blue, that's when bad things tend to happen. It's not a guarantee of bad things happening. Um, it, I, I equate it to, you know, in Wisconsin we get snowstorms, and we can drive in them, but we know the odds of an accident increase when driving in a snowstorm. That doesn't mean we can't drive in them, it just means it might be ill-advised. And not every snowstorm is the same. Same thing with markets. When orange is below blue, that's when bad things tend to happen. When orange is above blue, that's when reward tends to outweigh risk. So what we do is we just simply make a rule. When orange is below blue, we're gonna protect client accounts. What that means is that we can move into cash which generates some type of interest depending on if it's a money market um, or some other vehicle that is cash-like that we can protect accounts from these major drawdowns. So we can avoid being part of these major storms or these downtrends and participate in uptrends. For example, this past fourth quarter, which is zoomed in here, we protected our client accounts in December and the market dropped another approximately 8 to 9% during that time frame. We were able to reduce and then eliminate and then participate again. And so, again, this helps us avoid what I would describe as the math problem with buy and hold investing. All right, so if we t look at the S&P 500, year 2000, year 2007, 8, and 2013, right? That's 13 years sideways with a bunch of heartburn in between, right? So a $500,000 account balance would be cut almost in half by the end of this bear market. It takes five years to get back to even and 85% return, right? Minus 46% equals plus 85% return. 2008-2009, minus 57%. Just to get back to even took about four or five years and 132%. So I, I, I tell people all the time that maybe if we're blessed or lucky, we get to, to pick where we live when we retire. Um, you just don't get to pick the market that you get. We don't know if it's going to be an 82 to 1982 to year 2000 bull market, 
or if we're going to have a 13 or 14 year period where we move sideways. Happened in the 60s and 70s, happened in the 2000s, happened in the, the, the like 1920s. Um, everyone's familiar with the 1929 crash and then the 30s. Sideway mar sideways markets do happen and we have to have a way to navigate them. We use adaptive to do that because we can't have these massive drawdowns, these loss of capitals in our accounts that we're using to pay our retirement expenses, whether it's um, medical payments, uh, maybe it's our retirement living where we are, uh, maybe it's the trips we like to take. It could be all sorts of things, but we can't be in this predicament of where our account is down 50, 60, 70%, which takes then 100%, 150%, 233% to get back, just to get back to even. So we have to have a way to manage risk. And for us, we use the adaptive system because when orange is below blue, we can protect accounts. So the adaptive investment management system, we're always going to be identifying risk versus reward, right? Orange above blue or is orange below blue? We're going to invest with the direction of the trend. If we have an uptrend, we're going to invest with it. If we have a downtrend, we're not. We're going to manage risk using weight of evidence and position sizing. Right, the positions that we hold within the portfolio, they can be calculated based on how much risk they take when we enter because we're going to predefine before we enter something where the position would then be wrong and carry too much risk. So we know that prior to entering the trade. And of course, we're going to stay disciplined to the system and the hard data always, regardless of who's president, what elections are going on, what trade wars are going on, what tariffs are happening. We're going to stay disciplined to the hard data. We know investors want a straight line in their accounts. We also know we have to deal with market reality. That's why we use adaptive. It helps reduce those major drawdowns. And really the three outcomes of a position taken within an adaptive portfolio, big wins, small wins, small losses. You'll notice number four, big losses are what we're trying to cut out of the portfolio because over time that dramatically increases returns and stabilizes those returns. So you're not having as much fluctua fluctuation in your account balance. So we did a little study. A lot of work went into this uh, presentation, and I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Kevin and Ian put a ton of work into this, um, which is great. We did a little study on what would it like, what would have looked like to just buy and hold the S and P 500 versus uh, being adaptive with S and P 500 from 1965 to today. And buy and hold S&P 500 uh, is about a 3,400% return. Adaptive, while we like that it has a higher return, what I want to highlight to you is you'll notice that it's a little straighter line. It's not perfectly straight. We're still going to have some volatility and uptrends, right? It's not We can't grow accounts in a straight line. Um, and in fact, if we did, uh, that should be very concerning to you because that's what Bernie Madoff did is he made their accounts go up every single month. That's not how adaptive works. It is a straighter line. Okay, we're avoiding what I did. What we did on here is highlight the top three max drawdowns. Max drawdowns are what is the percentage that something dropped from a high to a low. And the top three in the buy and hold strategy are minus 43% in the early 2000s, minus 48% in, in 74, minus 54% in 2008. Now, there's many more than that. But we just did the top three to keep this uh, chart nice and clean so we're not overwhelming people. Adaptive over that same course of time, 1987 was the one outlier. And so these are the top three, minus 13%, minus 14%, minus 33%. That is dramatically different than these uh, drawdowns here. And I would say if you looked at the top 10, it's even more dramatic than that. So not only are we generating our higher return over time, we're also protecting from large periods of drawdown over time. And so we want to keep that in mind that the adaptive system over long periods outperforms and reduces volatility. This is what it looks like when we talk about drawdown. So basically what we're showing here, here is from a high to a low in an account balance, gray is what it would be like buying and holding the S&P 500. And for example, we can see the big drawdown in 1974. That was about 40 uh, 8%. We can see the one in the early 2000s. We can see 2000, 2008, how, how deep or steep these corrections were in gray. In blue is where adaptive fills in, meaning 
it prevents that further drawdown. There's still drawdown, but not to the degree of what the overall market is doing. And that's beneficial. It smooths things out over time. So we picked two periods. Uh, you know, as I talked about, we don't know what the market condition is going to be for the next uh, 12 years. And anybody who does tell you, um, you should probably run the other way because no one knows what the next 10 years, 12 years is going to bring, let alone next year. And so what we do uh, here is we did a study on the 1965 to 1978 period. If you just look at the gray line, which is the S&P 500, and drew a dot here and a dot here, this market basically went sideways with some pretty big corrections in them. The blue line is how adaptive would have operated in that environment, and we can see that it protects from these moves down in price. So by over that same period of time, you, you've actually increased the value of the account because you're protecting from these major drawdowns. 1998 to 2010 is the same thing. Uh, what we did in this, you'll notice again the gray line, if you drew a dot here and here, it's basically sideways. We even started the account balance behind the market itself. And you'll notice that over time, right, it allows this account to move up in value just by being adaptive. Now, notice that we're not talking about six, six months or um, any short period of time. Really, the adaptive system, it's about 36 months and longer, right? We're, we're, we're longer-term investors. We're not day traders. So we are looking for... Um, how a system performs over 36 month periods of time. And we can see over this 10 year period, how this moves up in a smoother line. It's not dealing with market reality. However, it's also not straight, but it's a straighter line to get towards uh, our client's investment goals. Kevin put this together. He did a tremendous job um, just helping communicate the one, two, three year adaptive performance and max drawdown numbers. So these are our models, our adaptive models, growth, moderate, balanced, conservative. We've got some benchmarks on here, meaning some, some common indexes, such as the S&P 500. That's what we talked about earlier in this presentation. The reason why this one is important is because it's been the best index for the past 10 years. So it's kind of like saying, hey, what, does, what, what is Aaron Rodgers doing on, on, a, on a daily and weekly basis? You know, we want to compare... Um, things to the best and S&P 500 has been the best index for the past 10 years. It, it, always, it isn't always that way and we can identify when that is uh, but for now the S&P 500 has been the, the best shirt on the block, uh, the best shirt in the closet for a while now. Russell 2000, that's 2000 uh, domestic small cap and micro cap stocks. NYSE, that's a little over 2,000 stocks, and it includes ADRs in them. ADRs are foreign companies who issue stock in the U.S. For example, like Toyota, they're based in Japan, but they issue stock in the U.S. It does a good job representing the overall stock market. Same with the Russell 2000. We've got the emerging markets here, which represents, um, you know, uh, developing or emerging markets uh, such as um, Brazil, uh, Portugal, um, Russia, those types of things. We also threw on here the Vanguard All World. So these are all the stocks in the world and then subtracting out the U.S. Going left to right, we have one year, two year, three year return and then a max drawdown number. And what you'll notice is that, like, let's just take a 36 month period of time, right? Three years. We want to see how something performs. Uh, growth has a, a total return. And again, these are including dividends, accounting for fees, all those things. Um, this is the net total return over that period. Uh, growth, for example, is plus 25%, and we can compare that to uh, night not quite as good as the S&P, uh, better than the Russell 2000, better than the S NYSE, better than emerging markets, better than international stocks. What you'll also notice that is not only is this getting market-like returns, but look at the max drawdown number. Max drawdown being how far from a high to a low did the adaptive growth model drop and how far from a high to low did the market drop? So notice how growth had a max drawdown of about 9%. The S&P had a max drawdown of about 19%. So we're cutting that drawdown in half. And notice what it takes to get back to even. If your account falls almost 20%, 
it takes almost 25% to get back to even. That's what this column means. What does it take to get back to even? So a max drawdown of 9 takes about 10% to get back to even. So it takes about twice as much just to get back to even when being exposed to markets um, buy and hold wise. Whereas we can still generate market like returns while greatly reducing by cutting in half or even greater the max drawdown. So that gives you an idea of how the system operates. And one of the things we did in our live presentation is we talked about what was Christmas Eve 2018 like without adaptive. Now, uh, I'm thankful. Uh, much of my family are also my clients. And um, so our Christmas conversations weren't necessarily all that strained. Uh, but however, maybe some of you who are viewing this remember or maybe were a little anxious about what was going on on Christmas Eve because this is what the S&P 5, 500 looked like or the stock market looked like on Christmas Eve. Notice how orange had crossed below blue. We protected our cl client accounts here. The market continued to drop uh, quite significantly. For some people, unfortunately, rather than focusing on the birth of their savior, they were focusing on potentially how nervous they were about what was going on in their account balance. What we did during this period of time is we had people open up um, a statement, and the statement basically showed what would it looked like to, to be adaptive on Christmas Eve versus uh, buy and hold. And it, it gave you examples on different account size balance. Uh, account balance sizes such as like a million dollars five hundred thousand dollars if you're interested in that and you want to see what that statement would look like you can email us at my team at clientfirsttaxandwealth.com in the subject you can put show me the adaptive christmas eve balance and we'll send that to you it, it, it's quite a difference in, in ian one of our newer team members i remember going out to um out to eat with him and he just said when when we were talking about this and how we protect client accounts and he's familiar with our process he just said what price do you put on peace of mind on being able to sleep at night when your account is not down 20 percent that has to be worth something i said it's it's worth a lot i think especially when you're near in retirement and those are the funds you have to have in order to live off in the, in that period of your life and so if you want to see what that looks like go ahead and email us and we'll be more than happy to send something like to, that to you. Now we're going to talk about the 500 days to nowhere. There's a reason why when I send out the invitation for people to join us that I put a roller coaster on there. Because roller coasters, right, they go a lot of places, but you end up back in the same spot. Um, for me, I used to love roller coasters. I had to stop playing football after my second year in college uh, between ankle injuries and too many concussions. Um, I had to stop playing, and one of the one of the side effects is I can't go on roller coasters because they give me a tremendous headache when I'm done. Um, so while I might love roller coasters, I also hate them, and markets can be the very same way. While we love them because we can use them to grow account balances, sometimes they go nowhere, and they don't allow much tailwind behind the market. And I want to talk about what's been going on for the past 500 days. For example, here's the Dow Jones, the most popular index in the world. Going back, this chart goes back into 2017. Here's January, January 2018. You'll notice something changed on January 2018. I'm not going to tell you fundamentally what that thing is because uh, I'm not sure that anybody actually truly knows. But what we do know is the price, which we're looking at, changed. Something changed. More selling than buying. A lot more volatility. A lot more heartburn. In fact, over 21 months, the Dow Jones has only moved 1.7%. That's about less than 1% annualized. S&P 500, same thing. January 2018, from that point to where we are, 21 months, 3.2% gain, which is about 1.8% annualized. And in there, it had a 20% drop. So not only have you barely had any return, you've had a tremendous amount of volatility and drawdown. And this is where we get into the flaw of averages, right? People will say, well, how can that be? How can the market have gone sideways for 21 months? I thought, you know, the media tells me or uh, a college textbook tells me that the market, for example, the S&P 500 averages 7.5% return. So how can this be? Well, in Wisconsin, our average temperature is 48 degrees. On January 15th, I can guarantee you that you shouldn't be walking outside expecting it to be 48 degrees. Just like on 4th of July, 
If we walk outside, we wouldn't expect it to be 48 degrees. Same thing in markets. To expect the market to have a 7% return is actually one of the lowest or the lowest likely scenario to have a return between 5 and 10%. Really, it's dictated by extremes. What this chart is showing us is that one out of five years or 20% of the time, the market's going to have a 10% loss or greater. Over on the right-hand side, 20% gain or greater, one out of every four years. So it's these extremes that are dictating our average. And remember, what we're doing is we're in the process of reducing these periods of time. Okay, so um, click my button too quick. Let me go back to this. Adaptive system is working on reducing this over here so that we can move the average up over time. And keep in mind, it's about uh, long periods of time, um, 36 months or greater. And what we want to be doing is taking advantage of these other market environments rather than winter in the market, right? When orange is below blue, that's when these scenarios are taking place over here. Here's another chart. This is the NYSE. We kind of talked about it already. It has 2,000 stocks, and it does a really good job representing what's going on in the overall market. Here's January 2018. We're still down 21 months later. We're down 5.5% with a max drawdown of minus 21%. Here's the Russell 2000, 21 months. Here's January 2018. This is one of the few that actually went up into the summer of 2018. But from January till now, still down minus 6.8% over 21 months. And from this point here in summer of 2018, or uh, September of 2018 through the bottom in 2019, that was minus 27%. This is the All World Index. We're looking at all stocks and subtracting out the U.S. Still down 14.5% over 21 months. China, major economy, major stock market, January 2018, minus 23% over 21 months. I think you guys are starting to catch the theme here. Japan. January 2018, 21 months later, still down 12%. Europe, January 2018, 21 months later, down 14.8%, with a max draw down of minus 23%. Latin America, 21 months, minus 19.4%, with a max draw down of minus 26%. Catching a the theme? Now let's look at a bright spot. Treasuries, January 2018, actually made it up 10% during that period of time, which is great. Uh, our clients owned treasuries for a, a little while in here in the beginning of the beginning to middle of 2019. Minus 13% drawdown in the middle of there. So there was a period of time, if you think about it, 2018, where stocks and bonds were down. In fact, October of 2018 was the worst period of time to be invested in both stocks and bonds because both dropped uh, quite significantly. And that's not what they teach you in textbooks or on TV. Um, Bond, stocks and bonds can drop together. Corporate bonds, 24 months. These actually started rolling over before the stock market did. Uh, we see that happen quite often, actually, where corporate bonds kind of signal uh, where risk-taking is, is going to take place or not. Minus 24 months, or I'm sorry, 24 months later, minus 2.3%. Oil, January 2018. Notice how it ro rose into the into October, September, October, along with small caps. That's because a lot of small cap companies are exposed to oil. They're energy companies. January 2018, 21 months, still minus 17%, with a max drawdown from a high to a low of minus 44%. Gold, one of the uh, pun intended shiny spots from January till now, plus 9.5%. Full disclosure, our clients own, own some precious metals for a little while in here in the middle of 2019. Silver, flat. January 2018 here, a lot of heartburn in between. It's now even or flat over that 21 months. So not a lot of places to be trying to generate return uh, over the past two years. Commodity index, so this is representing a broad basket of commodities. So oil, you know, uh, gold, copper, even agriculture products, you name it, represented in this index. 21 months, down 10%, minus 12% overall. This does a good job showing us in the upper pane here is S&P 500 going back to 2014. On the bottom here, this is percent of 
industry groups, right, that are in an uptrend. And let me explain that a little further. If we think of markets like a loaf of bread, and we slice that loaf of bread into, into pieces, each of those pieces can represent an industry group. Okay, so you could have a slice that's your technology stocks like Apple and Google and things like that. You could have an industrial slice that's Boeing and Caterpillar and Deer. You could have a financial slice that's J.P. Morgan and Bank of America. You could have an energy slice that's Exxon and Chevron. Each of those are a slice. This is saying what percentage of slices are participating in the uptrend. So we've got the S&P 500 moving, like crawling basically. So about 3% over this period of time up. Meanwhile, we're seeing compression. We're seeing less, less and less slices participate. If that were to change, that would be great. But what we're seeing is very uh, a difficult market over the last 24 months. We've gone 500 days, actually more than that. Just 500 days sounds nicer. Uh, more than 500 days of sideways markets with major corrections already taking place in the fourth quarter of last year. So what's the game plan? How are we going to handle this? How are we going to handle this market uncertainty? Well, let's look at a couple of things. So here's the Russell 2000. Okay, that's 2000 small cap domestic stocks. We see that uh, we're still down from January 2018. And we see that sellers keep showing up around the 157.50 level here. Selling, 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 selling. Orange just crossed below blue. Similar to back in here. So... Risk could be increasing. Risk could be greater than reward in small caps here. It's not a guarantee, but it's something to be aware of. Going back, we want to see buyers push the price above 157.50. That would be a tremendous uh, thing to see. That would be great for the market. This is the value line geometric index. Not many people are familiar with this. This is like saying, um, what is the average stock experiencing right now? So if you if you had a dartboard and it contained all the stocks on it and they had an equal size placement on that dartboard and you threw a dart, this is what the chances are of what you would find. You would find the average stock down 13% since January of 2018. We'd also see or orange below blue, so risk greater than reward potential there. Buyers keep showing up near this 500 level. We would like that to continue, and we'd like it to get above this, this blue line here where we're driving price upward and moving orange back above blue. The other thing to note about that chart, too, is this gray line, this 500 level. This actually, if, I, if, I, if you could go all the way across to the left on your screen over here, that would go all the way back to the year 2000 as a high. So it's very important that we hold this level from a really big picture perspective. All the world stocks, so... Um, they are down uh, since January 2018 pretty significantly. We've just seen orange cross back below blue again, so uh, more potential for risk than reward. We'd like to see buyers push the price above this 51, 52 level here that's shaded. Uh, that would be positive for the market. Oil, same, same scenario. Um, basically hasn't gone anywhere since January or down since January 2018. Orange is back below blue. We would like to see buyers defend this $50 level in the barrel of oil. Yes, while lower oil might mean lower gas prices, keep in mind that lower oil also might represent lack of de global demand. Uh, and we want to see global demand. We want to see companies doing well and spending money and putting uh, oil and gas into whether it's their products or tractors or you name it, anything industrial. We want to see $50 barrel of oil hold. Positives, semiconductors. Semiconductors, orange above blue, breaking out to new highs. It's a very definition of uptrend, right? We have a rising blue. Remember, we're talking about trends. We want to invest with the trend. Orange above blue, so reward is greater than risk. Everybody has a semiconductor either in their pocket or in their purse or in their car or they're in their appliances, so this is uh, something important. The largest semiconductor foundry in the world out of Taiwan and conveniently called ta Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. They just broke out to new highs too. So we're seeing semiconductors making new highs in the market with orange above blue. That's a good thing. Same thing with shipping. And I'm not talking about FedEx or UPS. I'm talking about big cargo shipping companies that are sending goods, thousands of tons of goods across the Pacific and Atlantic. 
we're starting to see that turn. If we got above 950, extremely positive, orange above blue, that'd be extremely positive to see shipping bottom and, take, and start to take off. Same with trucking. This represents what, um, you know, trucking companies like J.B. Hunt, um, Old Dominion, Freight Lines, things like that that are shipping goods across the U.S. Also in a good situation here. Above 820, that's a good thing. Orange above blue, that means we have an uptrend on our hands or more reward than risk taking place. That is a good thing. So we've got semiconductors up, shipping up, trucking up. Those are bedrock in, uh, items in the economy, and it's good that we're seeing higher prices in those because that could be the beginning of a turnaround here. From a sentiment perspective, one of the best investors of all time, John Templeton, he said, bull markets are born on pessimism, grown on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. I think everyone watching this video, and I know everybody in attendance agreed, we are not at euphoria. There, how many of you are sitting there going, oh yeah, the market's going to go higher? People are worried about a recession. In fact, I would argue, I saw an ABC poll where 80% of respondents were expecting a recession. That's not euphoria. And I don't even know if that's optimism. I would say that we're more towards skepticism. We've gone two years sideways to down, right? Two years of heartburn. We've had a 20% correction in there. Market really hasn't done anything for 24 months. That means client, you know, uh, uh, people's... Uh, 401ks, their IRAs, their balances really haven't done anything. People are skeptical, right? And we've got the media harping on trade tariffs and recessions. For us, we're not going to worry about those things. We're going to worry about price. Price is our guide. We fully acknowledge that the market has gone sideways, but I will highlight that from hard markets come easy markets. For example, this 13-year period here, the market went sideways for 13 years. Once we got above 2000, 2008, this has been a nice run, but we've had our own periods of sideways. This was two years of sideways in 15 and 16. Once we broke out of that, a very nice run up, and now we've kind of moved sideways again. If we can break out above this, that would be a very positive for the next bull leg. So our game plan, very simple. Okay, we're gonna, we've got orange above blue, so we're, we're invested with the market not as heavily invested until we keep staying above 2940. 2940 on the S&P 500, you can look for that on Yahoo Finance, you can hear it on the radio, but 2940, if we're above that, we're gonna be invested, uh, heavily invested in, in stocks. Below 2940, we're gonna be protecting. And the reason is, you'll notice that at 2940, nothing good below that, nothing good seems to happen. Gets sold, market gets sold below 2940, below 2940, the market gets sold. We can barely get back above it. So as long as we stay above 2940, that's going to be a very uh, positive thing. And we're anticipating higher prices because we're starting to see blue turn up. Notice how it was flat here. We're starting to see it turn up. Orange is above blue. This is a positive configuration uh, here at Client First. We are now feeling like we are leaving what I call driving in the mountains. Okay, so in periods like this, there's a lot of breaking and shifting uh, to protect accounts and to reduce any of these major volatile periods. It's very much like driving in the mountains around mountain passes where you've got to go like 25 and sometimes maybe even you know, like two miles an hour. If we can get out of this period here and see these in alignment, uh, the likely scenario, I can't guarantee it obviously, uh, the likely scenario is likelihood of higher prices and we can put the cruise control on again and drive 75 miles an hour. So at this point, uh, I'm going to switch this over and you're going to listen to a, a really great discussion that we had. Uh, Paul got a chance to ask some questions of Ian and um, myself. This is a great opportunity to hear Ian, uh, get to know him a little bit, uh, even though it's not in person. That's a great opportunity for you to get to know him. So take a listen. Uh, let us know what you think. I think that you're going to find some good insights in here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the question and answer panel. My name is Paul Zarling. I'm the managing partner for Client First Tax and Wealth Advisors. And I get to ask questions of uh, my teammates. The teammates are going to be David Zarling. Uh, he's with me here in, in West Bend, Wisconsin, and our other teammate is Ian McMillan, our investment analyst uh, located in Sterling, Virginia. 
and we had a nice live Q&A panel session when we had the education event um, recently here in October and Ian was actually in town for that so we appreciate you coming up and now that we're recording this video we're going to do it uh, using modern technology and, and living in the digital age so uh, Ian welcome and David welcome thank you thanks all right we're going to start off with some questions here Ian I'd like to start with you uh, you've joined us in uh, July of this year super excited to have you if you could give the viewers a flavor of your background and what you're going to be doing for our clients here at Client First. Uh, sure. So a little bit about me. I uh, have worked in the RIA wealth management space my entire career, so about 10 years now. Um, always on the investment side, um, so working with various uh, different types of investing strategies, um, and helping educate clients on those. David and I uh, have actually known each other for a while now, had met uh, earlier in the year at a couple conferences, got to talking over the summer um, about potentially working together, and uh, fortunately we've gotten to make that happen. Uh, we think very similarly, similarly about the markets and um, it's been a great fit so far, very ideal. And as Paul had mentioned, I do not live in Wisconsin uh, near the rest of the Client First team, but I actually live in the same hometown that Paul and David grew up in. So kind of a small world uh, happening there. Yeah, that is a small world. We were actually uh, really excited when it all kind of came together. Uh, maybe elaborate a little bit, Ian, on what you're doing for our clients. Uh, so we'll mainly be working with David um, inside the adaptive investment management process, managing accounts um, that way, helping educate clients. Also doing some other projects here and there to add value for our clients. Um, some new tools that are being um, brought out by client first. We've actually kind of been doing a small beta test with a few regarding one tool and uh, it's gone really well so far. Perfect. And just curious uh, for the viewers, I know the reason that you told us, but what's one of the reasons or, or a few of them of you know why you wanted to join client first? Well, first and foremost, I would say it was the people and kind of the culture that you guys had already built. I think you guys have are, you know, already have such a great foundation. Um, and I really liked more of the smaller RAA Main Street feel, giving back to a local community versus getting caught up um, in the red tape or the bureaucracy of a big investment management firm where you really don't get to be as nimble um, as you would like regarding investments. Um, I just think it's so much more ideal for the client base the client first has. Yeah, I appreciate it. So I, as we continue to grow like, like we have been and we've been blessed with doing, um, feel free to call us out Ian if you start to see any of that uh, bureaucracy. We like to think we're streamlined, um, but we're also uh, open to feedback as well. So now no, it's, it's been awesome. Perfect. So now I want to open up some uh, some questions. Um, bring in Dave. Dave, in the presentation, you talked about um, where there are some some points of strength, uh, where how the adaptive system, you know, perform versus you know all the other kind of uh, we'll say benchmarks. So um, add a little more flavor there. What what things have you excited about um, the next say fifteen months? And what things have you kind of concerned? And then Ian will ask you kind of the same question. Yeah, sure, no problem. If I can, just because we have the liberty of doing this, um, I'd like to swing back and just highlight that I'm really excited to be having Ian on board. I think it's going to be a tremendous value for our clients, um, especially when it comes to the adaptive system. One of the uh, designations that Ian has is uh, three letters. It's CMT. It doesn't stand for uh, Country Music Television. It stands for Chartered Market Technician. Um, that's a huge badge as far as expertise within the field, and so we're very excited to have that on board. You know, it's, it takes passing three tests. Um, you have to 
uh, be passed in front of your peers, basically like a board. And so having that talent on board is a huge win. There's only about um, 2,400 of us in the industry and to have two people like that is pretty awesome. And then to answer your question, um, some things that have me excited. Um, I don't know if excited is the right word because I try not to get either excited or angry or upset or any of those things. Really, we let price dictate. That's the number one feature of the adaptive system is we're focusing on price. As far as that's concerned, there, you know, as you've seen throughout the presentation, there's been a lot of uh, heartburn in the market for the past 20 to 24 months in many areas besides the Dow Jones and the S&P 500. A lot of areas are down anywhere from 15 to uh, sometimes 30, 40% and are still down from January of 2018. That being said, with everybody in the media kind of talking about there being a recession, part of me wonders if that's already happened. And so the economic data that is backward looking, so whenever they report a GDP number or a manufacturing index or anything, that's backward looking. Yeah. Whereas price is forward looking, right? The purpose of markets is to uh, discount or take into account the future prospects of a company or an economy, mm -hmm. six to 12 months in the future. So there is a thesis out there that fourth quarter 2018, that correction that took place, which was 20%, for example, in the S&P 500, was that reflecting the economic weakness and the data we're seeing come in today? Mm -hmm. So one of our thesis is that this correction that took place internationally and in small caps and across a lot of different equities, except for large cap US, that we could just be coming out of a poor market and just on the start of a new bull market. Now that's to be determined, but things that are supporting that thesis, semiconductors are breaking out to new highs. Everybody has a semiconductor, whether it's in their purse or in their pocket with their phone, uh, it's in their cars, it's in their appliances. Um, we're seeing strength out of shipping, and I don't mean like FedEx and UPS, I mean big uh, multinational shipping companies with cargo ships. Um, the price on that is breaking out to uh, new important levels and orange is above blue. We're seeing uh, new trends in those, same with trucking. Um, we're seeing new price highs in that. So when you combine those, when you combine, see, combine seeing you know, semiconductors, uh, trucking, shipping, those are some bedrock economic areas where if those are doing well, it's very hard to, to see us having um, trouble in the future. Um, that being said, we have our price levels identified. We know when that thesis is wrong, and we're ready to protect accounts in case that thesis is wrong. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you, Dave. Ian, I'd like to hear your perspective as well. Um, I have to echo David's sentiment. It's, it's hard to be overly bearish on the market when you have things like semiconductors, home builders. Um, when Dave talks about shipping, again, that's not... FedEx, that's big cargo containers that are shipping thousands of tons of cargo over the world. Um, and for me, and David touches on this a little bit later with a quote from John Templeton, but the overall sentiment just isn't there to make me think that the bull market is tapped out. There are a lot of very, very antsy investors, a lot of investors that have already gone to cash and are adamant about staying there. Um, and I think there's some other macro factors. Uh, we don't need to get into those that are a, um, a tailwind for the economy and the market. Um, but again, it's I, I side with Dave. It's hard to be downright bearish on the market right now. Got it. So let's look forward to Q4. Let's look forward to 2020, also presidential election year here in the U.S. Um, and then we've also got a unique thing, which is kind of being underreported, but all three of us have talked about it, and it's called the repo market. So with that in mind, maybe Dave, take a moment to just maybe elaborate on the repo market, what's happening, and then what kind of implications that could have 
you know, moving into 2020. Right. And I, I would say the repo market is a story uh, that many in our who are in the weeds of our industry know. It's a stronger headline in our industry than I would it's would than I would say it is on CNBC or any um, normal financial news outlet. So uh, most of the industry, and ourselves included, so every all the three people on here, um, we know of the repo market. We know a little bit how it operates, but as far as the inner mechanics, um, there are some things that are not knowable because we can't see them. So the repo market is this inner bank uh, lending process where banks are required to make sure that they have enough assets on their balance sheet to offset the loans that they've been given. And one of the ways that they can do this every night is go into this repo market and make sure that they can capture or bring in assets to make sure they're in balance. Now, a recent issue that we're seeing is that the Fed has started, uh, the Federal Reserve has started injecting uh, approximately $75 billion worth of liquidity into that market per day. That started at the end of September. Uh, originally, it was only supposed to go through October 4th uh, or October 11th, and now they've said we're extending it through uh, November 4th, and in addition, are doing some other type of um, buying of treasuries from banks. And what that does is if you buy a treasury and you're paying the bank cash, you're providing liquidity. So it's a little, um, it's something we're aware of. I mean, like, I don't, it doesn't give you a warm and fuzzy feeling that the Fed is injecting this much liquidity at this time. So while Ian and I might have evidence on our hands of um, a lot of bullish characteristics taking place right now, we're fully aware of the negative side too. Um, we never marry our opinions, you know, uh, all of us married our wives, but we don't marry our opinions. <laughs> right. Uh, so um, same thing in markets. Like while, while Ian and I have, the evidence is lining up for further upside in the market, we're fully aware that there's o there's always these things that are in the background that we need to be aware of. And that's why we use price, right? That's why we identify levels where if we drop below this price level or we see orange drop below blue, we need to take a protective stance. There's too much risk in the market. Mm -hmm. um, Right now, we don't see that bearing any any fruition, but we'll see. We'll find out. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you for that. Um, Ian, your thoughts on um, Q4 and, let's say, going into, into 2020. What's got you excited? What's got you concerned? Um, again, pretty bullish. Uh pre-presidential election years and election years, uh, clearly there's going to be a lot of noise out there in the media. It's hard to believe it could get any louder than it already is, but I have no doubt that it will. Um, and they're very well. Uh, we could just be continuing a sideways market until investors get a clear picture of what the 2020 outcome is going to be. Um, I think that depending on who wins, there will be uh, dramatic, dramatic effects in the market either way. And again, yeah, we could just be waiting, waiting it out um, to, to be decided, I guess we could say. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, maybe building on that, Dave, you and I did a video. This is a couple years ago. So if someone's just viewing this for the first time, they're maybe not as familiar with us, but we did a video on how the market operates when you know a, a Republican wins or, or a Democrat wins, and we did data all the way back to you know the mid 1800s. So maybe elaborate on how the market reacts. And interestingly enough, uh, even though people may have biases toward one part or the other, the market kind of doesn't. It just needs to know who's in, who's who's in and, and what the game is going to be. So if you can maybe elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, you're exactly right. I think. Um, again, people tend to marry their opinions and their biases, and uh, no one party has a monopoly on market returns. So, for example, you know, maybe you were a fan of, of President Trump being elected back in 2016, or, or maybe, maybe you were bu super bummed about it. Um, I still contend that regardless of who the, the presidential candidate or whoever it was that was elected, money would have flowed into certain areas and the, and the market was ready to move higher. Um, it's all, it, think of it as 
when an election happens, a, a shoe drops, and now we understand, um, and, and we're waiting for the dust to settle. And when that that settle that settling is capital moving into different areas where they're thinking the future prospects are going to be better. So while we saw the market rise in 2017, and and some people want to attribute to Trump, and you know, and some poo poo that idea. Just remember that regardless of the candidate who's elected, all that's doing is locking in some point of certainty into the market, regardless of who's elected. We also know that we're currently heading into seasonality-wise the best six months. Okay, that's another piece of bullish evidence. Now, if we don't follow that bullish seasonality, that's also information too. Election years typically are volatile. Um, The... um, fourth year of a president election, so an incoming um, or potential re-election of a president, that year is not as volatile as where it's going to be a brand new candidate no matter what. We know that it's important um, data, the direction of the market heading into an election. The prior three months seems to have some statistical significance to it, that if the three three months prior to an election are up, the incumbent party tends to win about 86% of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the three months prior to the election are down, that tends to favor the challenging party. Um, so those are some things we looked at. I know we talked about that back in 2016 when the media and polls and everything seemed to be pointing to a landslide victory for um, uh, Hillary Clinton, which would have been the in the, the, the incumbent party, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, President Barack Obama left under the... He was a Democrat. Hillary's coming in as a Democrat. Um, so they would be the um, remaining party, but the market was actually down three months going into the election. And we just proposed the idea that I don't think people should be as certain as they are about a Hillary victory. Um, same thing. These are clues we can look at um, going forward in into 2020. But again, nothing is 100%. We're just talking about statistical odds. Correct. Um, and even some statistical purists would say the sample size is too small, but the sample size that we do have, we can't just create elections going back, you know, to the 1500s because that's not when America was around. <laughs> exactly. So we have the data that we have, and using that information, um, it might provide some insight into into. I mean, we don't even know who the the challenge the challenger is going to be yet. Correct to President Trump. Um, so that'll be interesting, uh, and we'll go from there. I mean, we'll. We're, we use Bayesian statistics, and what that means is as new data comes in, it provides new information that we can then use to manage risk in client portfolios. And in the end, that's the number one job. We're going to manage risk, regardless of it's President Trump or whoever whoever the next president is, um, regardless of, of what that is. If it's, if it's him or someone else, we're always going to be in the business of managing risk. Uh, we never marry ourselves to, oh, if it's this party or if it's this president, then we're going to get long or we're going to get short. We use the data. And the data is always changing. The market's been moving sideways for two years. Um, that can that's that data shows us that it's a very frustrating period, but from hard markets come easy markets. And so if the data shows that we're going to catch a new trend, we're going to ride that trend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for that, Dave. And, and Ian, thank you as well. Uh, I want to conclude our, our sure. channel and um, really want to thank you. Ian, we're excited you're on, on the team. Uh, we're excited for both you guys and your skills that you bring uh, to run our adaptive investment management system. And regardless of if things are bullish or bearish or things that may have us excited or things are concerned, uh, we still can you know navigate with price and, and data. So whether we have the repo market, whether we have really awesome things with semiconductors, or we have an election coming up, um, all those things, a lot of different dynamics, but we can still use price and, and manage risk and um, you know, build solid portfolios for our clientele. So really appreciate that, and really appreciate you guys taking some time to, to answer some questions for our viewers. So appreciate that, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I thought that was a really great uh, back and forth between Paul, Ian, and myself. I hope you guys like that. I really appreciate those guys doing that for this presentation. I just want to wrap it up with some final thoughts and put this picture on here uh, as in, in juxtaposition to the um, to the uh, roller coaster picture that I put on there where the past 20 to 24 months we've seen the market go 
uh, everywhere but nowhere representing that roller coaster. If we can stay above 29.40 on the S&P 500 and continue to see orange above blue, we can have a, a rail track that looks like this and we're able to uh, move the portfolios into a more aggress aggressive position. As always, that market environment can change and we could head right back into the roller coaster and we could be in another 20% correction. If that happens, we're going to manage risk, right? We're going to protect client accounts. We're going to use o orange and blue. We're always going to be identifying risk versus reward with those signals. We're going to invest with the direction of the trend. There are three types. There's uptrend, downtrend, and no trend. We've had in the past 24 months downtrend to no trend, and now we're starting to see an uptrend. Uh, we want to invest with the direction of the trend. We're always going to manage risk. That's priority number one, right? We know investors want a straight line. We know we have a market reality. We're going to manage risk and uh, uh, be invested with the trend to uh, provide a smoother ride to our investment goals. We're going to stay disciplined in the system. Regardless of the, uh, of the past 24 months, the prior six months really were we're in this for long periods of time, and we're going to have three outcomes, those big wins, small wins, and small losses, eliminating those big losses from the portfolio over time. Next Lunch and Learn presentation is the third Wednesday in November, November 20th. It's estate planning with our strategic partner, our attorney, with our attorney Rob Melick. He's going to go through some lessons learned from real-life case studies, do's and don'ts for your estate plan. You can email us at my team at clientfirsttaxandwealth.com. You can call us at 262-335-1700. Or you can look for the email invite uh, to this presentation if you'd like to come and you can bring a friend too. It's a great time. He's going to cover some really important topics. Just want to highlight some new members. Uh, we're expanding our capabilities at Client First to serve our clients even better. We always want to put our clients first. Kylie Paradowski, uh, she's uh, interned with us now. She's going to be joining us full-time in Jan January 2020. Uh, Super quality individual, great at what she does. We're really excited to have her on the team. Uh, Ian McMillan, you got to meet him through the, the question and answer panel. Really excited to have him um, join us. Uh, he's going to add a lot of value, provide, be able to provide some education and content for our adaptive uh, investment process. Donnie Long also joined us. Um, he's from Cedarburg. He's joining the financial planning team. Super excited, super talented individual. We're excited to have him as well. So welcome, guys, and get to know these guys when you come to our Lunch and Learns. Don't, don't forget to introduce yourself to them. They're, these are great individuals, and they're going to be helping you guys out a lot. So that concludes the presentation. If you want a free or no-cost initial consultation to see how the true holistic planning can help, that's where Adaptive fits in. Adaptive Investments is just part of our true holistic process of all these different things. You can call us at 262-335-1700. Thank you, everyone, for viewing this. Share it with a friend.